Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode two of the Merry Go Round podcast. I'm Mary Brasha, and I'll be your host. Maggie and I just got back from the historic Tournament of Champions in Brigham City, Utah. We made the quarterfinals in women's doubles, yay! And I made the quarterfinals in mixed doubles with Dylan Frazier, so very happy with those results. And we also got lots of ice cream. <laughs> We did not make it all the way down to the creamery because I do think that was a two hour plus drive, but we went to Farr's and Nielsen's in Ogden and both of those places were really good and they gave big scoops of ice cream, which we're pretty particular about places that you can get your money's worth with the scoop of ice cream. So we will go back, but I want to take a couple minutes to talk about closing out a match. And I'll dive deeper into this subject in episodes to come. But this weekend, I really feel like this was a hard thing for me because in both quarterfinal matches, I won the first game in mixed with Dylan Frazier. We won the first game against Andrea Coop and Zane Navratil 11-6. And then in women's doubles, Maggie and I won the first game against Tyra Black and Anna Bright. 11-2, so we were really going strong, but in the mixed in particular, you know, in game two and three, I feel like my mind started to wander a bit where I started thinking about the outcome and three seed and mixed was eliminated. So I feel like the draw opened up and there was a good opportunity to make it to the semifinal and maybe make it to the final. And because of that, I feel like it affected my play. And so moving forward in this second half of the year, and I mean, now it's kind of like the last quarter of the year, I'm really focusing on training my brain to focus on the point at hand and be present in the moment. That is going to be a big thing for me to level up in those moments. And the second thing is when you feel like you need to close out a match, I got to play more aggressively, got to finish strong, play to win. And these are just little adjustments with the mind that can have a really positive impact in the outcomes of matches when you just stay in the moment. So I know that's something I'm working on. And I know this is a big problem for players at all different levels in pickleball. So if you have any tips or techniques for working on closing out matches, share them in the comments. Would love to hear. With that being said, Let's get started with our guest of the day. Today on the podcast, we have the first non-family member guest joining us today, but basically this person is like family. He is the head pro of pickleball at Lifetime in San Clemente, reached as high as five in the world for men's singles and also commentates on tour. We are going to welcome Daniel Roditti to the podcast. Here he comes. Hello, Dan. What's up? How are you? Good. How are you? What are you doing today? Not much. It's raining, so hanging out with fam here at the house. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we're on hurricane watch. We saw (laughs) in the news that for the first time in forever, there could be a hurricane coming through, so we are all staying dry. Yeah, it doesn't feel much like a hurricane, but okay. But are you as sad as me that you can't play pickleball today? Because I'm pretty sad. Well, I usually take Sundays off, so oh. it's pretty, it's good. It's fine for you. Well, break. That's good. Breaks are healthy. That's right. <laughs> well, Dan, I'm so honored that you are on my podcast and that we get to talk about pickleball together. And yeah. you are just one of the goats in our sport. So... <laughs> I wanted to ask you about your pickleball journey and kind of start with when did you start and who introduced you to pickleball? So I started uh, late 2012. Uh, So really first tournament, it was in 2013. So, you know, a little over 10 years ago, Uh, I had a couple people from church uh, tell me about it, but 
honestly, it took two years before I even went to see what it was because the name pickleball sounded so dumb that I didn't even want to see what it was. So, <laughs> so they probably invited me 12 years ago. And then 10 years ago is when I actually went and checked it out. Wow. That is, that's kind of a long time ago. You've been playing yep. a long time. You're, you're an expert in the sport. I mean, what have you been seeing change over the years as you've been playing? Well, I mean, obviously the speed of the game, the technology and the paddles and just the skill level. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's incredible seeing, especially with all the younger players coming in with um, especially high level tennis background, but even people that didn't have a, a tennis background, like a Dylan Frazier, who's incredible and, and never played tennis and so many other examples, but certainly all those tennis players have come in and just made pickleball so much more competitive. There's just so many really, really great players uh, mm -hmm. nowadays. And it's just growing every, every month, every, every week there's new people and which is great. Well, we need you on the court even more on <laughs> tour too, Dan, like you are still so good. And I'm old. I, mean, I feel like what said I'm old. No, you're not old. I mean, I know you used wooden paddles, right? Like when you first started. <laughs> <laughs> no, those came after. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Exactly. Just making sure. But I just got back from TOC, which yeah. is one of the most historic tournaments in our yeah. sport. And I was wondering, have you been to TOC before? Have you played in it? Yeah, I played it twice uh, when it was in uh, Ogden, Utah. Wow. And I didn't play it more just because I, you know, I was working full time, so I couldn't travel that much. Uh, but yeah, I played it. Uh, TOC, when I started pickleball, was uh, the only money tournament that existed. Like even nationals didn't pay as much as TOC. Uh, so everybody loved playing TOC because it had the most money in it. Looking back, it's, it's a little funny. It was probably $1,000 for the winner, and that seemed like a lot of money. But um, but no other tournament had money. So that was kind of one of the big ones that everybody wanted to play. And so all the best players played TOC and was considered one of the majors. You know, U.S. Open, Nationals, and TOC were the three majors. Now we don't use those terms anymore with just the tours and, and all the different how much is, pick, you know, pickleball's changed. But yeah, absolutely. TOC was huge, huge tournament. Wow. And is that your favorite tournament you've played or what's been one of your favorite tournaments you've played in? Uh, I mean, it's hard to beat nationals at Indian Wells. I mean, it's just, um, it's unfortunate that it's not there anymore. And that even in the five years that it was supposed to be there, obviously we had COVID. So one year got washed out. Another year was not as well attended as the others. And so uh, I don't know, it's hard to top that, but that's probably, uh, I've had some really fun matches there. Yeah. You're one of them. Uh, oh, what match are you yeah. talking about? <laughs> oh, I don't want to say, but we had a good run. We had some we we upset. Yeah, we had some good upsets. And uh, and then I had a lot of really good singles memories and, and nationals. So that's really fun. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, do you remember when we were at nationals and our warm up was like on the brick? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the brick floor that's a big thing at tournaments guys is getting there early to find a court and it can be stressful sometimes yeah. court hopping and trying to get a good warm-up so dan me and now you're big time me. now they like reserve a court for you so that's good no 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 dan i mean that would be nice but i'm always there two hours early trying yeah. to that's right find a court but it was us and west burrows and we were just hitting around those were the good the good days <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh my gosh well yeah nationals is for sure one of my favorite tournaments I feel like you can't beat playing at Indian Wells and especially when there's all courts dedicated to pickleball it's so cool I mean yeah. the courts are full it's just the best so yeah. I hope someday we get to go back there and play yeah pickleball. maybe but we will wait I wanted to jump into you mentioned how you were working full time and then also playing pickleball about, you know, now you're full time pickleball. But before you had a prior career that is pretty cool. 
would love for you to tell everyone about what that was. Uh, well, I think a lot of people know, but I was a pastor for 20 years, um, full time. And so that's when I started playing pickleball. I was already a, a pastor and started teaching a little bit on the side, but not a whole lot, just a few hours a week. Um, and uh, yeah, I just fell in love with the sport. I wanted to still compete, but my time was limited. So I just did as much as I could uh, when, you know, weekends obviously were tough since that's when I would preach. And so it was hard to play a lot of tournaments, uh, but uh, I got to have my fair share of, of tournaments, even, even though I was working full time. Cause again, when I started playing, there was no such thing as a professional pickleball player. Everybody had full-time jobs. Everybody did something. And then pickleball was just kind of a hobby for us. And of course it's changed a lot now. Yeah. Uh, and even though I'm full-time in pickleball, I'm mainly teaching, right? I'm teaching and coaching, uh, not as much playing, but, but that's okay. I, I I'm really enjoying the the coaching side of things and get to play when, whenever, whenever possible, whenever my body allows it to just yeah. face myself. Cause you go all out, Dan, like <laughs> when you're on the court, you are diving, you know, you were, you've been here before Elise Jones. I mean, Elise dives, but like you as well, I remember at the LA open, you had to take a minute because I think your knee was bleeding or something. Cause you're just all over the court. I don't know if we're remembering the same tournament, but I mean, Oh yeah, I remember it. Yeah. I've never been accused of being a smart player. So. Oh my gosh. Stop. People ask me why I dive and I tell them, well, cause I'm slow. Most people just get there by running and then <laughs> I just have to make up for the lack of speed. Oh my gosh. You know, it's flashy. It's fun. It makes <laughs> it more exciting. I feel like you're a player that everyone loves to watch. And that's why I'm still on the campaign of let's get Dan in MLP 2024. <laughs> I'm ready. <Yeah. laughs> you always put on a show. Well, it's fun. It's fun to compete. It's, it's, you know, it's just hard to be able to train and, and, uh, and dedicate the time to, to really compete at the highest level pro pickleball. is just, it's so tough. Obviously, you know, all about it. You're competing in it every week, but, um, for someone like me, who's kind of in and out, um, it, it's just amazing how quickly it, it continues to improve. And when you're playing in it, you don't realize it because you're improving as the game is improving. But from the outside, as someone who kind of, I get to peek my head in from time to time and play in pro tournaments. I just feel like everybody is so good. The skill level is incredible and, uh, people are finding creative ways of defending and attacking and, and and it's it's amazing it's so much fun to watch uh just the game change as new players come in and they come in with ideas and they're smart and they're trying to find ways to change the game and so it's 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 just fun to to be able to see it all oh yeah i mean and just the the paddle technology too the ball is just moving so fast now like drilling and just having quick hands and just speed is just so important so do you think in your opinion you have to be full-time pickle to really be able to compete at that highest level or do you still think oh absolutely I mean I think it's it's hard for I mean honestly what Gabe Joseph did this past weekend okay. is incredible uh I love Gabe and and yeah, I'm so happy for so him to take that title um I battled on the court with him many many times actually the LA Open you were referring to that was yeah that was two matches against Gabe that went three. Um, but he's a rarity. Like there's not a lot of guys like him who are not training full time. He's, he's working, he's teaching, mm -hmm. trying to make a living and then still being able to make those deep runs in tournaments. I think those are going to be few and far between the people that can do that. And, you know, and, and just a few years that maybe it will be rarely seen just because the level again, it's going to be, continuing to go up, right? People are training hours and hours a day, as, as you know, as a competitor and, you know, being able to rely on just some athletic ability and, and being, you know, pretty good. It's not going to be good enough anymore. You know, I think it's just, that's how competitive it's getting. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. There's just things changing every day in this sport. One thing I'm just thinking of now, though, that is a good thing in my opinion is that, the spin serve is gone. Oh, Thank goodness. My gosh, yes. <laughs> Do you want to 
remind everyone about our epic match against oh my gosh yeah Morgan. yeah i think uh i think our, your tiktok is is famous or infamous i don't know what the right word would be but <laughs> me just rolling my eyes and whiffing on serves left and right and chucking my paddle <laughs> thank you morgan evans um no and i mean that's an incredible skill right i mean morgan what he brought to the game with that serve and then of course zane and so many others yeah. was amazing but i just I, I did think it was it was not the best way to determine the outcome of a match is with one particular skill that can influence a match so much um so i'm glad they got rid of it it made for a good year and a half of laughs and and, TikTok. and feeling ridiculous trying to return <laughs> that thing but uh i'm glad it's gone now because I played Morgan Evans three times in the summer of 2021. And just, I think by the end, I sort of figured out the serve, but props to you, Morgan, for creating something so difficult. In the TikTok I made that Dan's referring to, we lost probably 13 out of the 15 points. Of that we lost match. 16, 14, and oh, nine right. of the points were serve like whiff returns, like the ball didn't <laughs> make it back nine out of 16 that's a lot that's a and lot. megan is an amazing player but all she did was serve and <laughs> get out of the way <laughs> it, it was a different a different time back then yes. wow yes um i want to jump into you kind of mentioned having battles with gabe joseph and another player that came onto the scene i'm sure most people know who this guy is ben johns so good at pickleball as we know you had some battles with Ben and what has it been like seeing his elevation in pickleball over the years and what was that like when he first came onto the scene yeah I don't know if you'd call them battles but yeah we've played <laughs> uh I don't think uh, okay. the outcome was ever in doubt but uh no I've played Ben actually I've never played him in doubles in a tournament I've played him four times in singles um SoCal Classic was the first time that's the first time I met him I had heard of him uh at the time people were already talking about him he was 19 I think wow and I played him in the I think the quarters of uh the SoCal Classic at at uh Bobby Riggs and um I mean you could already tell I mean I had no idea that he was going to be what he's become you know but uh certainly just how smooth he was how calm I mean, that was from the get-go. He was like that and just seemed effortless in the way that he moved. And he didn't look particularly fast, but he didn't need to because he would just anticipate so well. And fun fact, I tore my hamstring in that in that match. So oh. that was fun. Uh, oh, thank you, Ben. Um, <laughs> that was the first of, of four matches. But um, yeah, it's just, I think that's the biggest thing with Ben is he anticipates so well. Like, you yeah. know, there, there's some players you watch and you see their athleticism and they're so fast and, you know, Tyson, of course, Connor Garnett, there's so many Julian Arnold. Mm -hmm. Ben just seems effortless when he's moving, you know, um, just anticipating where the ball is going to be. And I had the privilege to drill with him. He was desperate enough to ask me, I guess there was nobody else around, but uh, <laughs> he asked me to to drill with him. And honestly, drilling with him was, was more eye-opening than playing against him because uh I got to see the routine that he that that he would do when he drilled or at least that day the routine he chose to use and just he was like a machine I mean it, it was like hitting with a ball machine and hardly missed uh and you know we all know when we're drilling we make so many mistakes and errors and and I, I, I mean, I swear he was making 80, 90 percent of the shots that were not easy shots that he was drilling. And it just it really gave me a greater appreciation, even than what I already had for him, because he worked super hard at his game. And uh, and so it's no wonder that he's you know as good as he is. But it's been fun to, to watch uh, him just get even better, which seems impossible, but. You know, he's doing it and he's getting pushed. I mean, there's other players that are pushing him that are really, really good that have beaten him, whether it's singles or mixed. And um, and it, it but it's good for him because it'll push him even more and he'll push other players. Oh, yeah. I wanted to, you know, add on to that, just how 
I haven't played Ben many times. I was one and oh against him, him but then but then and I just say that as a joke because obviously I know he's like the goat, but um when I've played against him the few times I have, he does not make mistakes. He just makes balls. So like if if I can just try to emulate that at all and just become more consistent like him, I think that's just really what makes him so special is he just makes smart decisions and he's just so intelligent on the court. And yeah, I think that's so cool that you have gotten to see him develop over the years and have matches with him. And that's just awesome. Yeah. Wow. Well, Dan, you are a singles expert also. I mean, you're good at everything, but I feel like singles, you're someone I try to be like (laughs) your backhand is just so good. What is a singles tip or two that you would give to someone who's trying to improve their singles game? Okay. Uh, I will say three things. I would say the order is you got to serve big. Mm -hmm. You have to serve big because otherwise you're giving up a lot of um, easier opportunities from on, on points. Uh, And so you have to be aggressive with your serve and live with, missing a few of them um but being aggressive which i i feel like i wasn't great at that when i played i should have been more aggressive with my serve um so that's number one number two i would say um and you know this this, these aren't revelations i mean obviously your 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 returns have to be consistent but i i would say if i had to pick one thing i would say pressure yeah apply pressure and i know you and i've talked a lot about this but it's it's pressure, pressure, pressure. You have to continue to apply pressure in, in singles and not just sit back and wait for your opponent to make a mistake or give you an easy ball or whatever it may be. Like you have to be willing to attack. And I know the men's game and the and the women's game is a little different. In mm-hmm. the men's game, you see a lot more of that pressure, like hardly anyone stays back. But I think even on the women's side, I think the players that even tend to stay back some when they are the most effective is when they're applying pressure. Um, and, um, that's true for Annalie. That's true for you. That's true for all the great singles players out there is that when you're applying pressure, uh, you're, you know, you're going to win more than more than not. And so I would say if I had to pick one out of those three things, I would say pressure and, and, and the serve is really part of that too. I mean, that's the return and the serve go along with the same idea of pressure. If you serve big, you can apply pressure with your third. If you return deep obviously you're applying pressure as you come in so that all goes together oh I agree I know when I'm in matches and you've been there for me in a lot of them and you say if you're not missing you know a serve or two it's not good so you've got to go for it got to go for the serve got to apply pressure I know I really like to be an aggressive player in singles I do like to come up to the net and I think that is a great way to play. And there's certain situations where you have to change up your strategy, but yeah, when you go for it, I think the success will come. So those are great tips, Dan. I, I'm ready to see some single stars come from this podcast. Hopefully, you know, refer back to it someday. Uh, That's great. Well, we've talked a little bit about just, how the game has changed over the years since you've started playing. What are some predictions or things you see pickleball doing in future years? Where do you see the game going? Gosh, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, it's changed so much. I think, I, you know, I tell people that when I started playing, um, you know, 5-0 was essentially open. They didn't even call it pro. It was just called open. Um, and what was then open is really what, like today, the level would be like a solid four or five, maybe low end five Oh, like that's just, the game has changed so much. Um, the skill level has, has gotten so much better. And again, it's, it's, you know, cause of all the youth coming in and people working on their skills, right? Like just literally developing new shots and new ways to play and defend. And uh, I mean, I I don't know where the game is going. Hope. I mean, I do hope that it can get a little more um, 
I, I think the competing tours is annoying. Uh, I know it's uh, there's not an easy solution, but but I just wish that you know there would be just be one tour, which I think is the future of pickleball, just like tennis or just like any other major sport, mm -hmm. that you don't have two competing professional tours that that um you know i think if it, if it could become one that's going to be best for everybody so yeah who knows when that'll happen but i believe it will um and i think that'll help and i and i see it um becoming bigger in college i know there's already yeah. you know club uh, duper clubs at a lot of the colleges and it's going to get bigger and bigger i mean i i certainly expect it to be in the olympics at some point yeah. Um, when that'll happen I don't know it still has to grow more globally obviously but um, yeah I don't know I just think there's going to be a lot of a lot of things that we didn't even expect uh, yeah. in pickleball well maybe you know your brother is coaching tennis at one of the top schools in the country maybe you'll be coaching the pickleball team and competing for who's going to get the courts at TCU in the <laughs> yeah, future exactly. <laughs> you never know also maybe I'm pitching to MLP teams that, you know, I obviously want you playing in it, but if you're not coaching MLP, hopefully we see you doing that soon too. Cause I just think you have such great insight. Um, do you have any camps or clinics coming up anytime soon? Um, you know, I don't have any, um, uh, coming up in the next month or so, but you know, for anybody who's watching this just follow me on instagram i always um post clinics that are coming up i try to invite uh some of the top pros uh i need to schedule my next uh my guest pros uh, the brasha sisters we have oh. to do that still uh, let's do it but uh not not as not as there to help but just uh, as actually the featured pros there oh. uh, no so. we're just we're just the background dancers for you <laughs> no. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure I'll have a couple in the fall and, um, uh, over at, uh, over at lifetime. And so, yeah, I mean, beautiful venue and be fun to, to host some great clinics and I had some earlier this year and, but the weather has been so crappy here, you know, most of the year that I know I'm complaining about Sorry. the weather in California. Sorry, people, <laughs> but a, I, hopefully in the fall, we can have a few more. That is great news. Yeah. So everyone be on the lookout for that. Dan, I am just so thankful for all you have done to help me develop my pickleball game. When I first started, you were there for Maggie and me as we learned the strategy of the game. We kind of did a boot camp with you where in the summer of 2020, we just did back to back lessons and you introduced us to so many different people in the area and just have been such a crucial part of my pickleball journey. And you're just one of the best humans I know. And it, like I said, before you came on, you didn't hear this, but I said, you're basically like family to us. So we're just thankful for you and happy you got to come on the podcast. I know you have a podcast. This is pretty awesome. And <laughs> what's so it called funny. again? The Dan, you don't know the name. It's I okay. know what it's called, Mary. Um, oh, okay. And where did the name come from? My shot, you know, the behind the head shot that you made. You came up with the Mary oh, Girl name. The, hey, I didn't make the shot. There's no way I can make that shot. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to keep drilling it so you get it. But yes, when I hit the shot, you were the one who said, oh, maybe the Mary Go Round. And there you go. it worked. There you go. And now it you got to. I know it's all be Dan, things are just lining up. It's just, you're the best. So. <laughs> oh, it wasn't me. Yeah, no, it wasn't me, but. Okay. I'm super happy for you. This is awesome. And thank you for having me. It's a honor to be on your podcast as your guest. And I'll just keep cheering you on. Thank you, Dan. Well, thank you everyone who tuned in to the Merry Go Round podcast. We'll be back soon. And Hope everyone has a great rest of their summer. See you.